Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the November 21st, 2023 Planning Commission work session. Ms. Adamwa. Thank you. Um, our first case is UP 2313, and Mr. Landfair will give the presentation. Mr. Thank Landfair. you. Good afternoon, Planning Commissioners. Good I'm afternoon. Bill Landfair, Principal Planner with the City of Portsmouth. This use permit application request before you today will allow development of a seven unit multifamily dwelling on a combined 0.45 acre area located at 2527 Moton Street and 2520 Turnpike Road in the general mixed use GMU zoning district. The parcels are currently vacant and appear to have been vacant since at least 2003 when the city began recording aerial imagery. The surrounding area consists of residential land uses, industrial uses, and vacant property. To the north are single-family dwellings in the multifamily urban residential URM zoning district. To the east are single-family dwellings fronting on Moton Street in the URM zoning district and vacant lots fronting on Turnpike Road in the GMU zoning district. To the south, across Turnpike Road, is a trucking company located on land in the light industrial, IL, and industrial, IN districts. And to the west is a single family dwelling fronting on Phillips Avenue in the URM zoning district. The proposed seven unit multifamily dwelling will feature standard wooden frame construction on a concrete slab and concrete block foundation wall. The siding will be vinyl, windows will have a six over six grid pattern, and the roof will have architectural asphalt shingles. Eight off-street parking spaces are proposed in two parking bays with access from a one-way drive aisle entering from Moton Street and exiting onto Turnpike Road. Staff is recommending denial of the applicant's use permit request. While the application would provide much needed housing for Portsmouth, it is inconsistent with the recommendations of the city's Build One Portsmouth Comprehensive Plan, and the conceptual site plan does not comply with all applicable zoning ordinance requirements. Typically, a use permit application that's not in accordance with the zoning ordinance would not move forward prior to addressing the outstanding items. The following are not in compliance. Please note that the listed items do not constitute a comprehensive review. Provide interior landscaping islands on either end of the parking bays. Ensure that off-street parking spaces do not require a vehicle to back out into a public street. Ensure that off-street parking spaces and drive aisles comply with all dimensional standards and provide an accessible parking space. It also should be noted that the property will need to be uh, subdivided and that the city's subdivision ordinance discourages the creation of lots with frontage on two streets, except of course with corner lots. Should the proposed use be approved, staff is recommending conditions for consideration by the Planning Commission and the City Council to ensure compliance with the general intent and purposes of all ordinance and code requirements and to prevent or minimize adverse effects from the use. To our knowledge, no public comments have been received regarding this application. I will now stand by for questions. Thank you, Mr. Lanfair. Commissioners, are there any questions? Hey, I have a question. Yes, um, why, um, why is this moving forward until this is corrected? That's a, a very good question. Uh, this application uh, was filed some time ago and there's been a lot of back and forth with the applicant. Uh, the plans that you see up there on the screen are probably the fourth or fifth iteration of the plans. And up until fairly recently we thought perhaps we might be able to find a way to support the application. Uh, it was a case of the applicant would address staff concerns, but then new issues would come up because of how they went about addressing those concerns. And in the end, I think staff felt that uh, we just weren't comfortable, that we just, with the proposed density of seven units on the property, given the property size, which is just under half an acre, given the configuration of the property, the L shape of the property, with the frontage on two roadways, 
that the constraints were just too much for us to be able to support the application. However, there are merits to the application, of course. First, it's providing for much needed housing. Um, but we really, we, we believe that because it uh, doesn't meet uh, all the criteria that is found in the ordinance, that in the end, we could not make a finding of support. Okay. Is it, um, is it asking for a a use permit because of the number of dwellings or just because of the apartments themselves? It's the use itself. The use itself, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, has the applicant tried to a site plan, I guess, uh, to compact or to lower the number of units? Would that uh, we, seem? Staff has discussed that with the applicant. Yeah, okay. Uh, the applicant, it, understands the constraints that they're working with. Okay. Uh, I mean, seven units is not a lot of units, but the property is relatively small. And again, the fact that it has frontage on two streets, uh, the need to provide for stormwater management, the need to provide for parking on site. I will add that the parking requirement for those seven units is actually 11 spaces. I was going to ask that same question. But they uh, received support from the city engineer to locate three of those spaces on Moton Street. But even with that concession, they still need to provide eight spaces on the property. And even with a one-way drive aisle, which we thought might solve some of the issues in terms of circulation and in terms of meeting the setbacks for the parking, even by doing that, they still have constraints and they still have, for example, I noted that we're not showing an accessible parking space. Mm -hmm. uh, the drive aisle width uh, closer to Turnpike Road doesn't meet the minimum standard in terms of perpendicular spaces backing out into the drive aisle. So there are just issues with it that we think because of its size and the applicant's well aware of that. And, and I thought at one point in time the applicant might defer the application and consider acquiring some adjacent property or even consider reducing the density from seven units to six units. But staff feels at this time with the seven units that are proposed that we just, we don't believe they can meet all the standards that, that we've cited as a concern. Okay. I, I do have one more follow-up question that I know. Um, for denial, assuming that they fix all these, mm -hmm. how um, how is it still not meeting the, the um, I guess the suggestions, the, the uh, comprehensive plan. Sure. So the, the plan uh, talks about this property being located in the mixed-use corridor. And the mixed-use corridor designation applies to all major roadway corridors in Portsmouth. And it supports a mixed-use pattern of non-residential, commercial, light industrial, and residential development. It also talks about in the plan encouraging coherent connected land use patterns. And the concern that we have here is that the building, the way it's oriented, it's really oriented to the center of the site. There are two entrances that serve six of the seven units. They're oriented to the center of the site. Only one of the units, a ground floor unit, actually fronts onto one of the streets, in this case onto Moulton Street. So the building doesn't really have a relationship to the street, and so we feel this is not a good planning practice. Um, we really would prefer to see the building perhaps even broken up into two buildings, one that would front along Moton Street, one that would front along Turnpike Road. That would also have the advantage of locating parking behind the building. So as you're driving along, the first thing you see is not parking, but you have the buildings, and the buildings are located close to the streets. They're helping to activate the streets. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Commissioners, any additional? Yes, I do. Would you say that the applicant feels comfortable with knowing that the planning department, the staff, that you all have done all you can to help bring this particular proposal to what we call in the business world completed staff work? I don't know. I, I think that's a question perhaps that needs to be asked of the applicant. I know the applicant's very frustrated. I can imagine. Uh, I'm frustrated just listening to this. Sure. Uh, again, with the, the 
the three, four, five different iterations of the plan, the back and forth that we've had with the applicant. Um, I know the applicant's frustrated that we haven't been able to arrive at a, at a good solution for the property. I think from staff's perspective, we just feel in the end we have too much density on this property. Could it work with less density? Yes, it probably could. Uh, but with the seven units that are proposed, we just don't see a solution right now for this, for this project. And because of that, and because it doesn't meet the standards, we're not in a position to support it. And you've conveyed this dialogue to the applicant? Yes. Yes. And what was their response to that? Well, they were very disappointed with the final decision that we, we took. Uh, you know, they felt like, again, they had gone to an awful lot of trouble, again, back and forth, back and forth, trying to address staff's comments, right. staff's concerns. But in the end, not being able to do so, I think they were frustrated. But we tried to convey to them that, in this instance, we just feel we have too much density for this property. It's a very small site. This is less than half an acre in size. You know, given its configuration, given the frontage on the street, given, given all the standards in the zoning ordinance, both for the parking, for the access, for the building itself, stormwater management, landscaping, et cetera, there's an awful lot to ask on this property when you have seven units. And we feel like, well, perhaps with six units, maybe we can make it work. But the applicant has you know, a program that they need to move forward with. You know, they have certain expectations in terms of how to maximize their investment in this property. So it's their intent to move forward with the seven units and hope that uh, something can be worked out. And even staff felt up until, you know, as we were resolving and trying to finalize our report, we thought maybe there would be a solution. At one point, we even uh, sent to the applicant a suggested layout that maybe they, they could look at and maybe that would help guide them, if you will, uh, through the standards. But in the end, we just couldn't arrive at a layout that met all the standards. And so here we are today. Thank you. Commissioners, anything, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, actually, I, I do. Um, thank you, ma'am. Uh -huh. um, so there was no handicap. I didn't see it in any of the drawings at all. Is that even? Uh, that's not a, probably not a good practice at minimum. Is it even right through most correct. of the drawings from the very beginning? And the, the the initial plan and most of the iterations of the plans actually showed an accessible parking space. And I'll I'll show you up on the screen where it was located. I mean I don't see one here. This one. So this was the accessible parking space. And it makes a lot of sense because this ground floor unit is an accessible unit. Mm -hmm. And so it's close to that unit, it's close to the sidewalk that will take you into the building. It just made a lot of sense. But in the last iteration of the plan, they weren't showing it. They didn't show the proper dimensions for it. It may be that it's just an oversight. It may be that they realize they can't accommodate it. Um, but that historically was where that, that space was located. Is that not a lot? Is that not required by by law to have a? You, you need to have an accessible a, space, at least right. one space in this instance on this property. So I, I mean, again, I'm please don't take this the wrong way, but I'm not sure why, as this board, we're even given some sort of autonomy to be able to make a decision that could potentially be in conflict with law. Um, I, if you have an answer uh, well, for that, I'd, yeah, I'd love I would, to hear it. I would but, just say that. Um, what the design that's there right now is not necessarily the finalized design. Uh, after they get a use permit, they have to go through the site plan process. If you look at the conditions um, the bill has put in the application, uh, it says it'll look substantially like this, except it will comply with all of these things. And it's the things that he listed out uh, earlier for you where the this does not comply. Uh, with what's required, so we are at we are at an initial stage going to use permit, and then there's a final site plan which is going to have to comply with everything. But I understand your stance, sir, and thank you for answering that. However, if it, we already know it's a tight site, if you drove past the site, which I try to do with all these spots, one, it doesn't really look ultra consistent with everything else around it. One, but let's stop. Lay that aside. You know, you you still have to have certain uh, requirements of size for a handicapped space, 
and given that you're using it looks like every available potential spot for a space in that design right there it doesn't give it shouldn't give much of us much faith in that the final version of this is going to have a handicap space so um, that that's my concern the other side the side is that um, do you know anything about what the market what they're trying to charge for this do you know anything about the size of the the apartments anything of that nature that you can possibly provide for us? the um, I might have noted in the staff report the size of the unit so the the ground floor unit particularly room number of rooms I guess is, uh, what I'm is 800 square feet in size so that strikes me as small small very that's small. very small uh, the other six units average 1500 square feet in area that's according to the architect which strikes me as reasonable uh, but I'll let the applicant speak to whether they've done any market studies or <coughs> what they're thinking of in terms of um, rent rates etc okay yeah that, that was my other question it wasn't yeah. detailed in the uh, was the rate cost per square footage or rent per rent cost per square footage so, thank you sure I have a follow-up question absolutely just one more follow-up question yeah if we were to approve this um, for it to, to move forward mm -hmm. um, there's no proffered uh, they're not proffering seven units it, no. it it could go he they could only fit five on here but it would still be the multifamily and still have to meet the site plan yeah it's okay. conceivable they could come back with six units right sure and meet yeah. and still just meet the site plan so we're right. we're just looking at the use in total for the multifamily correct Cor okay right. thank you right but the plan itself is mm -hmm. showing seven units right and therein is the issue mm -hmm. seven units requires X number of parking spaces, those parking spaces need to meet certain standards, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Commissioners, anything else? Any other questions? If there are none, uh, Ms. Malzone? Hello. <clears throat> How are you today? I'm good. Um, so the application for UP 2319 is a request for a use permit to develop three townhouses at 4423 King Street. Um, the applicant has requested deferral of this application to the January 2nd Planning Commission public hearing to provide additional time to discuss this project with the West Haven Civic League and continue to address their concerns. Thank you. And then we have uh, Julie Chop, Kingsgate Crossing. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, this applicant has also requested a deferral in order to um, redesign the site plan as well as the elevations, and they are requesting a deferral to the December 5th Planning Commission meeting. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Uh, next, we have Valerie Malzone, Hattonsville. Hello again. <laughs> um, the application for UP 23-21 is a use permit to operate a shipping container and chassis storage yard at 3015 Airline Boulevard. Um, the app, well, planning staff is recommending deferral of this application um, into, until the January 2nd Planning Commission public hearing. During the interdepartmental review of this application, the city engineer determined that the that a traffic impact analysis or TIA would be required for this use permit request in order to evaluate the potential effects of the proposed use on the surrounding roadway network. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Landfair, Victory Crossing. Thank you. So good afternoon again, commissioners. Yeah. Bill Landfair, principal planner with the city of Portsmouth. This use permit application request will allow operation of an event space banquet hall located at 4010 Victory Boulevard, Suite B of the Victory Crossing Shopping Center on approximately 9.48 acres in the general mixed use GMU zoning district. Recently, you may remember a, a use permit for an entertainment establishment, UP-23-18, was approved for the same shopping center just a few units away. The surrounding area is commercial and mixed use in character with retail sales and service uses predominating. 
To the north is a Lowe's Retail Sales and Garden Center, zone General Mixed Use, GMU. To the east, beyond Victory Crossing Shopping Center and Missy Elliott Boulevard, is a 30.49 acre vacant parcel in the multifamily urban residential URM zoning district. To the south is Interstate 264 East and its off ramp for Victory Boulevard. And to the west, on a separate 7.42 acre parcel in the GMU zoning district, is an extension of Victory Crossing Shopping Center and a freestanding telecommunication tower. The applicant proposes to open an event space banquet hall, catering to professionals, elderly, youth, and families. Proposed events will include banquets, weddings, networking events, and private receptions. The event space banquet hall is adaptable such that it can be configured to accommodate approximately 100 persons seated at tables or up to 150 persons without tables. Proposed facilities include a kitchenette equipped with a range and refrigerator for the preparation and catering of food, as well as two bathrooms and a dressing room. Existing security cameras are located throughout the suite. Proposed improvements include updated bathrooms, lighting fixtures, and a new sound system with soundproof capabilities. Hours of operation will be seven days a week, 7 a.m. to midnight. One employee will be on site Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for showings, bookings, and event inquiries. Otherwise, staffing of events will be the responsibility of patrons. The proposed use is located within an existing suite of the shopping center. Aside from recently installed signage, there are no plans to modify the exterior of the building. There is adequate off-street parking within the shopping center parking lot. The property is designated on the future land use map of the comprehensive plan for commercial type land uses. Staff is recommending approval of the applicant's use permit request with conditions. With those conditions, the proposed use will be consistent with the recommendations of the city's Build One Portsmouth comprehensive plan and will be appropriate at this location. To our knowledge, no public comments have been received regarding this application. I will now stand by for questions. Thank you, Mr. Landfair. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Landfair. There is none. Uh, next item is uh, Julie Chop, <coughs> citywide. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Julie Chop, uh, Manager of Current Planning and Zoning with the Portsmouth Planning Department. This presentation will provide details on the uh, proposed text amendment to the city's zoning ordinance. Staff has determined that several modifications to zoning ordinance standards related to correctional facilities are appropriate. The current definition of the correctional facility use includes both publicly and privately operated correctional facilities or facilities that house individuals awaiting trial or serving a sentence after being found guilty of a crime. A correctional facility requires a city council approved use permit to operate and a use permit may only be requested for a property that is within the light industrial or um, industrial zoning districts. Two public correctional facilities um, are currently located within the city. Portsmouth City Jail is located at 701 Crawford Street um, and primarily houses those with short-term sentences as well as inmates awaiting transfer to other correctional facilities. The Portsmouth City Jail was constructed in 1969 to accommodate 197 inmates and now houses approximately 450. Due to the prime waterfront location of the Portsmouth City Jail, relocating the jail and other municipal buildings uh, to, make may, to make way for private redevelopment has been a long time goal of the city. The Hampton Roads Regional Jail was established in 1998 on the approximately 38 acre property at, third, at 2690 Elmhurst Lane to provide extra capacity and serve inmates requiring special management from Chesapeake, Newport News, Norfolk, as well as Portsmouth. The jail was constructed with the capacity to house 1,300 inmates and now houses roughly 200. 
On October 18th of this year, the Hampton Roads Regional Jail Authority unanimously voted to close this facility by the spring of 2024. Numerous studies have shown that the private for-profit correctional facility model encourages business, the business to cut corners, which can affect inmates' safety and as well as their quality of life. Jails are a large institutional use that have a significant impact on the local community and do not provide significant community and employment benefits compared to similar uses of that scale. Staff requested that the Planning Commission initiate amendments to the zoning ordinance to prohibit private correctional facilities in order to preemptively mitigate and minimize the potential negative effects of the use on surrounding lands. At the October 3rd Planning Commission public hearing, a resolution was adopted initiating staff to prepare amendments to the zoning ordinance that prohibit the establishment of private correctional facilities within the city. The proposed zoning ordinance amendment language is shown on this slide. Um, the amendments prohibit privately operated correctional facilities within the city by removing privately operated facilities from the definition of correctional facility and revising the use um, correctional facility to public correctional facility throughout the ordinance to clarify this, the prohibition or the, yeah, the prohibition of privately operated correctional facilities. Public jails are an unfortunate necessity. However, a private jail is an inappropriate use for <coughs> Portsmouth, where much of the land is already developed as it would put additional strain on city resources and bring little economic benefit. Staff recommends approval of the proposed amendments to Zoning Ordinance Chapter 40.2 of the City Code in order to mitigate and minimize impacts on surrounding land uses and protect the interests of the citizens and businesses while maintaining the health, safety, and welfare of the public. This concludes my presentation and I will now stand by for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Chop. Commissioners, are there any questions? No? Okay. No. Thank you. And under new business, we have a few. Before we go to, oh. uh, excuse me, Madam oh, sure. Chairman. It's okay. Before we go to new business, uh, Brian Sweats, <clears throat> a manager of Comprehensive and Strategic Planning, will give you a presentation on Innovation District. Okay. I have a clicker for you. Mm, yes. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Let's talk about something a little more exciting, a little more fun. <laughs> no offense to uh, your storage facilities and your code amendments, but let's talk about development. So I came to you guys a couple months ago to talk uh, about this innovation district project that we've been working on. I'm back to you today to talk about the recommendations that we sent to you yesterday for your review. I want to emphasize here that this is a draft. We are here to get your feedback on what you think is being recommended. We're gonna take that feedback into account. We're also gonna be meeting with City Council in December. We'll be meeting with the Economic Development Authority. We have another public meeting scheduled for next Tuesday, where we're gonna bring all this out to get people's opinions on what we're doing, and then we'll make those modifications and ultimately bring them back in a final plan. I wanted to do a quick thing at the beginning to remind you about what this innovation district is, but we'll spend most of the time talking about the recommendations for the plan itself. So this is where the innovation district is currently located in the inside this red line. This is already in the zoning ordinance. This was created as a replacement part for the old form based code neighborhood that was out there. We changed the zoning and then it was reclassified as the innovation district. The reason that we're, the benefits of putting this out there, one, that there's a lot of city owned and economic development authority owned land that's out there. Land that we don't own, there's a lot of vacant and, and or abandoned properties. So there's a lot of redevelopment potential at relatively reasonable costs. 
We've also got the city's fiber ring out there. It's already been constructed and wires have been laid. So this is an opportunity to bring super high speed internet access to potential businesses in the district. We've also got some recent development out there that we want to build upon. <coughs> We've got the Hamp new Hampton Roads Community Health Center. We've got an affordable housing complex on High Street, and then we've got these beautiful townhouses. Both of those last two projects are currently in site plan review. They've already been approved by City Council. And then finally, we have the High Street streetscape that we are still waiting on the federal government to sign our paperwork so that we can get the money. But as soon as we've got that, we have the project 100% paid for between the state and the federal government to build a new streetscape along High Street. The plan recommendations themselves, so there's gonna be a number of categories here that I want to talk about in, in order to try to help keep, uh, make it easier to understand, I put a little outline on the side and in black will be what we're talking about currently. So the first section I wanna talk about is urban design and placemaking. What might the place look like? We've talked about the streetscape before with you all, and we've this idea of uh, designing a road for all users. So if you use this model as kind of an example, you'll see that you've got buildings pulled up to the street to activate the street. So that's good for retail and office. It's good for things like restaurants and outdoor dining. We've got these uh, bump outs with the, this is just not fun when I can't use the pointer. So we've got these bump outs here to make it easier for people to cross the road. Currently it's like 60 feet across High Street. Adding uh, infrastructure like this makes it shorter so that people can get across faster, which makes it safer. We've had uh, multiple pedestrian fatalities out there over the last couple of years. We've had a shocking number of auto accidents for a place that doesn't have a whole lot of traffic. So doing what we can to redesign the road to make it safer would be better for everyone involved including a shared use path for people who want to walk or ride. This would be part of the Portsmouth segment of the South Hampton Roads Trail, which is like a 40 plus mile trail that runs from Driver and Suffolk all the way to the oceanfront. I don't know if there are any like people out here who ride bikes who like wearing spandex and all that kind of stuff. Those people are okay with riding on the streets and we've had policies you know, in the past that have kind of encouraged that, but for most people, most average people, people with kids, you don't want to be out there on the street riding your bike. You don't want to take the chance of someone coming up behind you and knocking you off. So putting a path like this away from the street just makes everyone feel a whole lot safer. We've got uh, bus stops and shelters along the corridor that we want to make sure that are going to be integrated correctly into the streetscape design. We want to introduce ideas like sustainability. So we've talked about the grass median, for example, that would be running down most of the center of High Street. Tree plantings uh, with tree wells that can help suck up water. Uh, introducing more canopy coverage. All of these things is make it a greener location. And then finally, we want places where we can put in more public art to help beautify the space. For example, this is not what would be out there, but this is a type of structure that if you put out near the Martin Luther King connector, people who are driving by would naturally have their eyes drawn to it and makes you wonder what's going on down there. Why is there something like that exists? <clears throat> if you're driving under the Martin Luther King connector, then you have the opportunity to put uh, lighting in there. So for example, let's say there's a Norcom football game, you light up the bridge so people who are coming underneath it, it contributes to like the school spirit and sense of community. <coughs> Excuse me. We have opportunities on the other end of High Street closer to downtown where we can put in smaller art installations. You can add in ornamental plantings, anything you're doing to make it so it's not just pavement everywhere. It gives you something more exciting to look at including the idea of expanding like a whole city public art program. This is, I took this while walking through a neighborhood in San Diego where I could not believe how much public art they were. They decorated the tree, uh, what, what tree wells, or whatever you call those, the planters. You've got the trash cans were decorated. You can see that the fences and walls were painted with murals. The highway underpass, all the structures were painted by local artists, reflecting history of the community. It was just an incredible way of bringing the community together and creating a sense of place. I saw an interesting idea up in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, where they had the whole neighborhood come out to paint a mural. They literally put 
you had someone come and do like the paint by numbers, you know, like when you're a kid, you get the book and, you know, color one green, color two red or whatever. They did that and then the community itself painted the mural, which I thought was kind of cool. But this also gives you the opportunity not just to have different kinds of art, but it gives you a chance to give exposure to local artists, right? So you could have displays like this where you could have like a little gallery uh, label with a QR code where people could actually purchase someone's artwork. That gives you the opportunity to help people build their own brand and business while also you would kind of recycle through stuff so it keeps feeling new and then if someone is disappointed with what something looks like well it may not be there forever we're going to you know come up with new ideas to replace us to kind of keep it feeling fresh one of the concerns that we heard about from the neighborhood when we were out there was that there was a feeling of uh, being unsafe and that there's a lot of crime and so one of the recommendations would be to make it safer intentionally through its design. So when we replace the streetscape, we can put in new LED lighting where it brightens up the neighborhood so that when you're walking, you can see people, you feel a lot more comfortable. You start eliminating shadows, you make it so you can see facial features, all those things that help contribute to people feeling safe as they're walking up and down the street. Also, there's uh, an idea of a program called Com Community sorry, crime prevention through environmental design. And this, finally, <laughs> it's only taken me like four presentations to get that right <laughs> on my own. The idea, this is a known thing, this has been around for decades, it's the idea that you can design your streetscape, you can design your property in such a way that it'll naturally be safe. So normal things would be like having front porches, right? So people sitting out on the front porch, out in the stoop, you're watching the street, eyes in the street makes other people feel safe because they know that they're not alone, they know that there's someone out watching for them. You can train staff, you can train, say, the police department, in this kind of program and then they can help people better design their sites so that they can prevent crime or they can help themselves feel more safe. Um, you can also, you know, we could look at creating a grant program to help private property owners who are already out there to upgrade their properties to be able to institute some of these ideas, again, to help increase safety in the neighborhood. From a land use and development perspective, our philosophy here has been if we know what we want to build, we need to make it as easy as possible to build that. So for example, we want to be bringing mixed use development into the neighborhood. We know we need housing because we want to support local businesses and local businesses are best supported by people in their neighborhood. And we want to be able to allow people to have more, have developers have more assurance that the projects that they're uh, bring to the city have a better chance of being approved. So ways that we could do that would be to say remove the use permit requirement for mixed use development. This would not be for multifamily, this would be strictly for mixed use. That way we're making sure that we're getting that ground level activation that we want that encourages people to want to be in the neighborhood, but it also helps incentivize to get some more residential development out there because there's actually not a whole lot of development out there right now. Another thing would be to increase the height limit of the buildings out there. We're, I have six stories on here. We're trying to nail down exactly what that height would be. That's based on the building code. What we hear from developers is that you can build up to a certain height using wood, but you get past that, you have to start using metal, and that's when it becomes way too expensive. That's why you don't see any you know buildings up of five or six stories other than down at the edge of Old Town, which has been around for a while. We just don't see that new development here. So, but making sure that if people want to build something like that, they have the opportunity to do that. We want to revise the zoning ordinance to make sure that the uses that we want in the district are allowed by right, and conversely, uses that we don't want are not gonna be allowed. So on High Street, for example, we don't want drive-throughs. We wanna leave that on London. We want this to be more of a pedestrian-friendly area, not more suburban-style strip mall, you know, your Chinese restaurant, your um, dry cleaner, a nail salon, drive through restaurant, stuff like that. Well, that makes sense on London. We don't want it on High Street. We want to change the parking requirements out here. So normally when we talk about parking, we talk about the minimum number of parking spaces you have to have, right? Instead, we want to look at it differently. We want to say here are the maximum number of spaces that you can provide. The reason being that parking does not benefit 
either the consumer because they're paying for it in terms of higher rents or the developer who is building something that they can't monetize. So if we can reduce the number of parking spaces that are required, we make it more eco-friendly because there's less pavement, we make it cheaper for developers to come in and build something, we make it cheaper for businesses and residents who are coming in there because they are not paying to subsidize for free parking. We've gotten a little bit of pushback from that and we do want to study what would happen if we are so successful that we start running out of parking spaces. But to my mind, that would be a fantastic problem to have. You know, it, when I heard this, this concern, it reminded me of the old Yogi Berra line that no one goes anymore because it's too crowded. You know? yeah. Now getting into what different sections of the Innovation District might look like. First, we've got the Martin Luther King Gateway area. So this is the Martin Luther King connector right here. You may recognize from driving through here, this is mostly light industrial type stuff. You see some like chassis storage yards and, and uh, light manufacturing type things. We have made a commitment to that neighborhood going back to 2016, 2017, that we don't want to do anything that is going to infringe on their ability to use their property the way they already are using it. So we don't want to do anything to change that. What we do want to do is create the conditions where people who are successful in the maker spaces I'll talk about in a second, if they start expanding and being successful, they have a place that they can go to start manufacturing their own products and help expand their own businesses. The second area uh, that we're looking at is this maker space here. If you remember from me talking to you about this before, the concept here is that you've got these kind of light industrial warehouse buildings where you divide up the inside into, say, little workshops, and you provide tools and machines for people who have ideas about a new business that they want to create. They've got a place to come in and work. So if you think about, say, like laser cutting or 3D printing or, you know, mechanic, like a car mechanic, you know, you, you may not have the money to buy the tools and machines that you use. You may not have the space in your garage to be able to do all the things that you want to do. Having this kind of space that you can go and you can buy a membership, which gives you a workshop space and access to all these tools and machines, it's a way to help people who don't have as much upfront capital but who have an idea get a chance to practice and work things out before they start investing heavily in things like space or machines or employees or what have you. We want to be, the city controls and the EDA controls a lot of property in the section of High Street that we could reconfigure these buildings, we could renovate these buildings so that the outside is structurally sound, the roof is ready, the elect, say the electric, electrical work is fine. Someone buys that, comes in, and then they fix up the inside so it fits with what they need. We've talked about this idea of creating gathering spaces for events or for just sitting outside on a nice day because we want to encourage people to interact with each other. The, the common thread that we found in successful innovation districts across the country is that when you encourage different people to interact with each other and start sharing ideas, that's when you get truly innovative thinking. It's not from people sitting and working by themselves or working with a friend. It's when you start meeting other people who take you in, in directions that you had not anticipated yourself. We've also looked at this idea of creating a small business support center. This would probably be something that would be staffed by the city's economic development department, where you would have someone on site whose job it was specifically to help people grow, start, grow a business, deal with the city. So say you need to figure out how to get a permit to do something, right? There's someone there who can put you in touch with the correct person to talk to. Say you need to figure out how to do bookkeeping, you'd have uh, that kind of like business development center where you're connecting people either with workers who can help you or just helping you get a better understanding of how it is that you do your own basic accounting. The next step is this health and wellness square. So this is going west uh, down High Street. This would be approximately IC Norcom right here. And you've got the new community health center right here, I believe. Um, the, we, when we talked to the community health center, they had told us that there's a lot of health uses that the city needs that we don't currently have. For example, an urgent care center. So what we want to do is we want to find, first of all, what it is that we do need by doing this idea, this healthcare needs assessment and figure out exactly what the market is looking for. 
and then work with a developer to help us bring those uses to this area. That could be something like a gym, it could be something like a chiropractor, it's not, it doesn't all have to be traditional Western medicine, for example. It doesn't have to be stuff that's competing with Bon Secours and Maryview or the, the Naval Medical Center. We want to do things that complement that. That's why you see uh, all fast food restaurants that tend to be located together, right? Or you've got um, two grocery stores across the street. You would think that they'll, they would be in competition with each other, but in fact, they help each other by being around each other, being together. And so we want to bring that same concept here to the healthcare industry, especially because we know that the healthcare sector is growing like crazy and that those jobs are really good paying jobs that aren't getting outsourced and definitely paying better than the medium wage here in Portsmouth. So this is a chance for us <clears throat> to grow our own, as if you remember me saying that in the last meeting, where we can work with places like Norcom or TCC and you're getting people trained to do these good jobs that aren't going to go anywhere and have good have a good future uh, that the jobs themselves you know lead you in advancement we also heard from the community that they wanted us to address these ideas of resiliency and sustainability so for example economic resiliency the ability the ability to bounce back from something like covid right that small business support center is a great place where if someone's having a problem something unexpected happens We've, they've got support that they can lean on that we can help them try to get through a tough time. For sustainability, a lot of times when people hear that word, you think of the environment, but it's more than that. It's the social aspects and the environmental aspects of making sure that you're helping people meet their needs now, but you're not preventing people in the future from meeting their needs by, say, uh, using up natural resources. How can we do that in the district? Well, I mentioned all these buildings that the city and the EDA currently own. We can reuse those structures, which reduces waste, but it also lowers upfront capital costs and infrastructure costs for people who are looking to start new business. This complete street will do wonders for the environment out here, but it also means that you get more people interacting with each other, which is great for social cohesion. And by having more people on the street, it's good for economic development because you're getting more customers. Tree planting. There are like no trees in this district. This is partly a legacy of this being a red line district from back in the 30s. Uh, and it's also a legacy of all the old car dealerships that were out there. But the end result is that it lowers property values. And this is one of the hottest places in the entire city. So by introducing tree planting along the new streetscape, you're lowering heat or cooling costs for people who have property out there. You're raising property values for people who have made it through this time. All of this works together to make this a more sustainable district. We've tried to include the values of equity and inclusion throughout this entire process. For example, this is an area that has both enterprise zones and hub zones. These are places that, uh, these are, excuse me, these are districts that give you tax incentives for hiring local people. So if we can create jobs out there for people in and around that community, that benefits everyone. We know that we want to do a better job of supporting small business because especially in Portsmouth, half of our businesses are minority owned. Uh, almost 44% are owned by women. And so I'm trying to make sure that we are creating the infrastructure and the environment to help them succeed. Again, that's helping to grow our own. It's helping to put money into the city that then stays in the city. It's not being shipped off to a, health, to a headquarters in some other state. And we want to improve access and this kind of, you know, captures everything that I've, I've been mentioning throughout this presentation that we're trying to reduce costs so that we can help people who are there without displacing the people who have lived through all of this time where we, the city has not invested or paid attention to in this neighborhood in this district. In order to do that, we know that this is a long-term process. We're looking at creating some sort of advisory team or committee so that we can keep focused on the district. We want to invest city, have a continuing you know, budget item that we are investing in the district, and this group can help us to identify where that money could be best spent. They can help advocate for changes that we need because we know we're not going to get everything right off the bat. Plus, things change over time, and so we need to make sure that we're adaptable to meet people's new needs in the future. And finally, we've looked at adjusting the boundary to the district as well. So this is, in the black line, you've got your current district boundary. By adding in these industrial properties here, right now it looks like it's really just used for uh, chassis storage and container storage. This will give the city more land and, and more ability to incentivize development in the future for if we want to 
be able to have like say more light manufacturing out there. And then on this end of the district, this is part of the downtown design committee where you've got design standards. One of the things that we want to do to incentivize development is to remove design standards. That makes it harder for people to get through the process. So what, we've what we are advocating for is changing that boundary to include, especially the Bloom co-working space. This is a good example of an anchor institution that's incredibly successful right now that we can build off of that momentum throughout the district. But we've also got a lot of old properties out here that, to my mind, while they're on the National Historic Registry, they don't really contribute much to a sense of place. The analogy I've used is that if you go into an antique store, Sometimes you've got antiques and sometimes you just got old junk. And a lot of the stuff that we have out here <laughs> is just old junk. And so by prevent making it harder to redevelop those properties, we are hurting the city to save stuff that's really not worth saving. This is gonna be the you know pretty controversial part of this and I'm looking forward to talk to you about it. But I would say I would advocate that there's a lot out there that we could do to make things better without sacrificing our sense of place or our sense of history. So I tried to run through that because I know we're coming up on our time. We've got about five minutes. I would love to get any feedback that you have. Thank you, Mr. Sweats. Uh, Commissioner Jiggets, you yes. had a couple questions. I do have a couple questions. If you could go back to the slide mm -hmm. where you show the bicycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nope. Here we go. Yep. All right. And. Um, I just want to make sure that there is no type of plan from the city to install those stick up yellow poles. The ba uh, ballers? <laughs> I don't know what you call them. I know, I've know i seen them on 35th Street in Norfolk. Yes. They are awful. Yes. Oh, especially down the center of the street. Yeah, no. I don't, I don't care where you put them. I yeah. think it's, t it's a terrible idea. Yes. So that's why by separating it out like this, you've got on-street parking, you've got planting, and then you've got your shared use path, so you don't need the ballers to do that. Okay. You're not. Yes. I'm going to hold you to that. I agree with you. <laughs> okay. And the other thing is when you show um, the artwork, I think, from California, mm -hmm. I would have called that graffiti. Okay. So I hope there will be some type of um, <laughs> input that defines okay. us graffiti and does not look like really what you just presented. Because I thought, honestly, I said, that is graffiti. So I can appreciate so, that. We had, yeah. there, is, there is an existing nonprofit <laughs> called Support Portsmouth Public Art. So they are real 501c3. They have a board of directors. You know, they everything is all legal. That's the type of organization that we can work through to be able to get our um, commission in the district. So yes, there are going to be things that go up that probably not everyone is going to like, and we do have to figure out how best to create a program that satisfies the most possible people. At the same time, we have to, I think. I think we all have to agree that art is in the eye of the beholder and there are going to be some things out there that not everyone loves and so being able to find that balance is going to be crucial so that it doesn't just look like graffiti but it's also reflecting the point of view of the artist and the point of view of the community that's out there. Yes and I hear you and my feedback on that would be this. To me to prevent that from becoming graffiti would be to always let the displays be temporary mm -hmm. so they change out yep. you're not going to have anything painted on a coffee cup like you know <laughs> it will whatever is going to be it will be changeable changes out to something else to keep it fluid sure to keep the art creative mind growing in right. the right direction yes agree thank you mm -hmm. yes ma'am um i know this might be from norfolk but any plans to get the scooters so that people can travel up and down the innovation district so <laughs> we applied for we applied for a grant um, that, um, that we were going to be studying things like scooters and bike share and or even we, a light rail or even light rail is not going to happen. Okay, I, happen. I would okay. I would love if it would. Need them. Unfortunately, the economic reality is that are okay. not happening. Not happening. Okay. But bike share and scooter, yeah, that's something that the city is looking at. We're trying to figure out how to make that work. Okay, it, it's needed. We need we need more uh, of that here because it seems a lot of the cities are, are thriving. And having, we're still stuck in the old times. Mm -hmm. 
the old is gonna fade away. And if we're not planning for our new future and the, and the kids and those who are able to come, then we're, we're gonna have nothing left. You know, if we're gonna have nothing left. So I think Portsmouth have to get this mindset of being stuck. This is not the 1960s, this is not the 1970s. We are evolving and we must evolve with the time and the technology that we need to go further or we're gonna to continue to be stuck in Portsmouth. And I'm not gonna live in a city and work in a city that's stuck. I need something for my kids to thrive. If not, I'm gonna move down to Wales where we're gonna thrive at. <laughs> as simple as that. I pay too much money in taxes here. I, I appreciate you using, too I appreciate you using the word evolving because that's literally one of the pillars in the comp plan yeah. is that the yeah. city needs well, to no be matter else, I pay a lot of money in taxes. So yeah. Well, I, you know, there are some of us who don't agree with yeah. that. Yes, I do. No one wants to see scooters, personally. I don't want to see them here myself. Oh. So you have different perspectives. Yes. But you don't and, live downtown. And, I don't live downtown. You don't live down this area? Really? Okay. Yeah. I guess I, I, I it's guess. It's not about our personal guess, preference. It's about the future. We're not going to go up our personal preference. Hour. But let me say this. I don't, I'm glad we don't have scooters. They have been a headache no, for other quiet. cities. They've been a headache in Virginia Beach. They've been a headache in Norfolk. And you're going to get a lot of feedback on this and pushback from a lot of people, I do believe. But so just to make just, 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 just to be folks. just to be clear, this plan itself is not going to have anything to do with scooters. That's going to scooters and bike share will be a, a separate thing. But it is something that we are attempting to study because we know that there are a lot of people, especially downtown, who don't want scooters. They don't want to see them on the sidewalks. They don't want to be tripping over them. So we understand that that's an issue, and that's something that we we'll want to talk more about with the community as well. Yeah, and we I can go. We certainly we don't want that type of increase in crime. Say, commissioner, there's commissioner. Other resolutions. I actually have a number of kind of procedural questions about all this document documentation that was just given to us today is it our expectation that we're going to accept and vote on each one of these items today it the resolutions all these resolutions yeah. and there's an attachment that's 15 pages that was not a part of our packet that was just a, a summary. that was that was the background for the presentation to the, the presentation the innovation district that's not something you need to vote on so what I'm, what I'm asking though is we like to usually have these types of things in our hands so we can review them. Ahead of time. I do, I do take this packet that comes to me very seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the plan, mm -hmm. things that the Planning Commission and the Planning Department has done better than even our Economic Development Department was that we would get our packet on the Friday before that Tuesday. And this department has done stellar in getting this documentation ahead of, ahead of time so we can review it, ask questions, get feedback, all those types of things, um, especially if we're talking about possibly wanting to change zones and things that you just talked about, especially closer to the downtown area. I, I find that something we should probably uh -huh. look at and be able to, to see and maybe talk to some people that are down in that area before we vote on that. Is right. that something that we have to take up today or we're, is that something You that are not voting today on changing any sort of boundaries or districts. Okay. The only thing that you are voting on um, in the innovation district, an example of that, is allowing staff to look at doing that so that we can bring you back potentially a proposal and then that would have a staff report and presentations and, and the whole nine like we've done today for your consideration. Possibly even discussion. a public hearing. Things in, pu in public hearings, yes. Okay. Yeah. All okay. of I just, I just want to make sure we're... Okay. Yeah. The resolutions are just our to-do list for okay. the next year. We want you to have some buy-in to let us move forward with what we have listed. I so you, we, as he said, we'll come back with a report. We just want you to know we're going to review subdivisions, we're going to do innovation district and all of that. Yeah, I just understand that this was handed and then we went right into our presentation. <laughs> so I didn't have a chance to even review your resolutions or anything. So, okay. okay so think, thank you. I think they are. I thought they were in the packet. I nope. didn't see it in 134 it, yeah. pages of. No, uh, they, they are. They're, I guess you're right that they're at the, at the back. They're, they're in the package here at the back. But they're in the, yeah, they're in the very back. I didn't, I didn't see it. That's why I'm. Okay, commissioners, uh, if there's no, is there any further discussion? Okay, if there isn't, this uh, concludes our November 21st, 2023 work session. We will reconvene in the city council chamber at 1.30 for our regular session. Thank you. Okay. That's <laughs>Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to this very important meeting 
today, Tuesday, November the 21st, 2023, in the City of Portsmouth City Council Chambers. Madam Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Commissioners, we will now have roll call. Please indicate your presence electronically. Somebody, okay. Six members of the Planning Commission are present. Um, after, yeah, she closes the, the vote, it, it should show up. It showed up on my screen. Yeah, it's not showing up on Okay. But it is being, it is being um, recorded, though. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm thinking about the viewing. I understand. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, before you are the minutes of the October 3rd, 2023 public hearing. If there aren't any changes, we are in need of a motion. I'll second. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from the October the 3rd public hearing and you will be voting electronically. The minutes are approved by a vote of six to zero. Commissioners, uh, you were provided minutes from the joint meeting between the Planning Commission and the Board of Zoning Appeals, July 18th, 2023. We are in need of a motion to approve. I move to approve the minutes between the joint meeting of the Planning Commission and the Board of Zoning Appeals. We have a second. Yes. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from the Joint Board of Zoning Appeal and Planning Commission meeting on July the 18th, 18th. 2023. You will be voting electronically. The minutes are approved by a vote of six to zero. Our next scheduled work session is Tuesday, December the 5th, 2023 at 12.30 p.m. City Council Chamber Conference Room, followed by public hearing at 1.30 p.m. City Council Chamber. Items reviewed today will be presented to City Council for action at their December the 12th public hearing or as otherwise noted. Planning Commission rules limit a speaker up to five minutes to speak. We also ask that everyone please silence your cell phones at this time if you have not already done so. Our first item, UP-23-13, Mount Hermon, Keystone Investment Firm, LLC, request a use permit to develop a seven-unit multifamily dwelling on the combined 0.449-acre parcels located at 2520 Turnpike Road and 2527 Moton Street in the general mixed use GMU zoning district. The future land use map of the Build One Portsmouth comprehensive plan designates this property for a mixed use corridor. The properties are owned by Keystone Investment Firm LLC and is further described as tax map 183 parcel 48 and 48.1. The staff coordinator is Bill Landfair Will the applicant or the representative for this application please come forward and present your application at this time? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for uh, allowing us to uh, take up some of your time to hear us out on what we're trying to do um, for this particular um, piece of property. Uh, I'm sure you've already went through the whole presentation, so I know there's no reason to read the entire thing. Um, but what we would like to um, do is we want to develop in a, in a section that is um, an eyesore right now. Um, I'm sure if you rode past it, you've probably have seen it. It's been like that for years. Um, and we want to um, just install some uh, 
upgraded some luxury apartments. Um, nothing real loud, real large, but um, we think it will help. Um, you know, it, it will help the community. There are there are similar apartments um, located down the road. Um, some have turned the exact same way that we had, you know, uh, designed this one. We also realized that this was not the final product. And I, I was sitting in on the uh, earlier, and I think they were discussing something about the parking situation. And even though the particular one that we saw that was on the screen didn't show a handicap space, but the one that we have, um, it does designate um, one for a handicap uh, parking for one particular uh, unit. And also, the, uh, the units that we had described to do, um, there was a single one unit the, the, that was facing Multi Street. Um, it's actually designed for uh, a handicap type accessory um, person. But either way, we realized that it's not the final, it's not the final uh, design. Whatever other adjustments that we need to make in order to make this happen, then we're willing to do. But of course, there was no reason for us to go any further until we can at least get an um, opportunity to present it to you to see can we get a, a user permit to go any further. Thank you. Sir, would you mind providing us with your name, please? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> my name is Berlardo Costin. And this is my partner. Brenton Hill. Thank you. And Are you finished, sir? Any, yes. Any okay. questions that we could answer, we'd be happy to. Okay. Try. Commissioners, are there any questions for the applicant? Commissioner Hines? Thank you, Madam Chair. So you did say you identified a handicapped space. Um, for the benefit of the commission, could you identify which one you're referring to there? Sorry, so for the for the for the one story at the end um, yes. is you're identifying that one as such? I believe these are actually uh, numbered in our packet, so I'm trying to find the number real quick. Also, uh, we were told by the um, the civil engineer. The civil engineer for uh, Portsmouth that you could have three additional parks on the street of Morton Street. So he actually pointed out no, space number three that's in our packet, it looks like. That's okay. the handicap space. Uh, I did have a, a, a couple of other questions, if I may. Go ahead, um, question. Mm -hmm. So uh, you. This looks like, you know, and again, I drove past this spot. And for, first and foremost, let me thank you for wanting to invest in our city. You know, um, I know that there, at times um, this can be uh, quite a uh, process. So, so thank you for that. Um, but um, the, the space itself looked like it would be rather small for, for seven apartments. Um, could, could you maybe just, you know, for the, for the viewing audience and, and maybe for us a little bit, maybe just explain the size of these apartments, and then also as a follow-up, what is proposed proposed rents um, for for that? If you can maybe share that for us, that would be great. Well, Thank the you. one bedroom was an um, 800 square foot um, handicap apartment, um, and the, the two is two um, two bedrooms, two bath. Um, they are about 1,500 square feet apiece, but. Um, reason why we t even turned the building that way was we was working with Meg first. Uh, I don't think she's no, no longer with the planning. And she's, she proposed to us that we turn the building facing that way. Because I heard you say in the uh, meeting earlier that it don't look like nothing else over there in that area. But she proposed that, that we turn the building that way. And um, I mean, if we're just trying to get a use permit. If we have to reduce the apartments to like take the one bedroom off or you know just to get a use permit i think four and over you have to have i mean five and over you have to have a use permit so that's why we came you know t before you guys today but in as, as far as the rents um the one bedroom is going to be 1300 and the two bedrooms will be 1600 but that's the market value right now with everything is going up you know 
I thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, any further questions? Anyway. Sir, if you don't mind, would you repeat your last names for us? Yes, sir. And, and, spell, it and spell it, please. C O S T I N. Thank you so much. Hill, H I L L. H I L L. Okay. Thank you, thank you. both again. I'm surprised you didn't ask for my first name to be spelled. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to. Thank you both very much. Commissioners, are there any further questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public hearing on item UP-23-13. I have no registered speakers. If someone here did not get an opportunity to register and would like to address this application, you may come forward and you have up to five minutes to speak. Appearing to be none, Madam Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, this public hearing is now closed. Is there any more discussion? If not, we are in need of a motion and a second. I have a question. Oh, you have a question? Oh, okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Lanfair, um, I did have a question. And I should have brought it up. I apologize for um, not bringing it up, but I didn't think about it now. Um, the engineering department let, let him get to the podium. is um, uh, saying mm -hmm. that you can do three parking spaces on the street. Is, is that something that is typically done with with developments I know downtown it is because of the the limited parking that's down there mm -hmm. but this is not an area that that ha I guess would be considered um, I guess intensely developed so is this something that has been done before or is it on the onus of the of the property owner the developer to provide the parking spaces on site the answer to your first question is yes, it can be done anywhere within the city. You can have up to 50% of your spaces uh, located on the nearest adjacent roadway if the city engineering department finds that that will be acceptable, that that will work. Uh, in this instance, the parking requirement is 11 spaces for the seven units that are proposed. Uh, in recognition that it's a tight site, the applicant went ahead and asked for relief, essentially asking to put three of their required parking spaces on Moton Street. And the city engineering department looked at that and had no issue with that. So they were fine with, with doing that. So the applicants within their rights to ask for that. And in this instance, the engineering department said, yes, go ahead and do that. But that still reduces their requirement to eight spaces, which have to be located on site. On site. Okay, correct. So this would be a case-by-case -case basis that correct. engineering would, would do. Exactly. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Excuse me. Thank yeah. you. Commissioner Chickett. Yes, Vice Chair. Hi, could you repeat your question again, please? I didn't really hear it. The question to Mr. Landfair. Landfair, Landfair please. Thank you. Yeah, it was um, if engineering was... Um, could grant the parking relief not to provide all of the parking spaces on site. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Landfair. Is there any more discussion? If not, we are in need of a motion. Ms. Commissioner Hines. Yes, I actually have a question for staff in, in this. So if, if we were to proceed onward with approval, I assume during site plan review, things of that nature, you would assure that the appropriate ramping and other ADA requirements are met um, at or around that space that's been kind of identified to us. I'm, I'm assuming that would be something you guys would review and um, the way the conditions are written, it looks like it would be an up to seven, not to exceed seven. So the number could, it, could actually go downward to meet the requirements mm -hmm. that are applicable for the ADA and some of the other city ordinances that uh, were identified earlier, correct? Yes, that's true. Up to seven, he'd have no more than seven, but he can have six, five, less than seven. 
and doing site plan review, we would look um, at, to make sure that he, he, he adheres to the standards. Thank you. Commissioners, is there any more discussion? Okay, if not, we are in need of a motion and a second. Madam Chair. Commissioner Hines. I'd like to make a motion that we approve UP 23-13 with the proposed conditions. I second. Madam Secretary, we have a motion and a second. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Motioned and second to approve UP-23-13 with conditions. And you will be voting electronically. This item is approved by six to zero. Our next item, UP-23-19, Joseph Pulley with Armhole Marketing Services requests a use permit to construct a three-unit townhouse development on an approximately 0.22 acre parcel at 4423 King Street in the urban residential UR zoning district. The future land use map of the Build One Portsmouth comprehensive plan designates this property for low to medium density, single family residential uses. The property is owned by Arnold Marketing Services and is further described as tax map 308, parcel 75. The staff coordinator is Valerie Malzone. The applicant has um, requested a deferral of this application to our January the 2nd, 2024 Planning Commission meeting. However, we will open the public hearing if there is anyone here who would like to speak on this application you may come forward and you have up to five minutes to speak appearing to be none madam chairman and members of the planning commission this public hearing is now closed thank you madam secretary commissioners we need a motion to defer UP-23-19 to January 2nd, 2024. Madam Chair. Commissioner I'm, Hines. I move to defer the application UP-23-19 to the January 2nd meeting. Excuse me, the public hearing needs to be kept open and not closed. Um, we're going to advertise it again so we can actually close it because that meeting isn't until January of 2024. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. So we're good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Hines made a motion. Commissioner Hines, you I made the made motion, a motion to I defer. I made a motion to defer second. to the January 2nd meeting. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Commissioner Curry, second. second. Okay, Madam Secretary, we have a first and a second to defer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Motion to second and defer to the, do y'all need a moment? Madam Chair, yes. while they're fixing their technical item here, I'd just like to just do a quick uh, apology to staff for missing those earlier uh, resolutions and for putting it in. Y'all did put it in the packet. I just oversight. It was an oversight. So I do want to thank you for getting them in. I'm sorry for the oversight. Okay. Commissioner Hines. And then Curry. Commissioner Curry. Curry. Second. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We're good. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Roll. Okay. 
motion and second will be voting electronically to defer. This item is deferred to the January the 2nd, 2024 meeting by vote of 620. Our next item is UP-23-20. Kingsgate Crossing, Don Scott Esquire, uh, on behalf of Safe Stowe Real Estate Company, LLC, request a use permit for a four-story, 104,700 square foot self-service storage unit with 800 units on the combined 2.19 acre property at 3206, 3208, and 3210 Airline Boulevard and a portion of 3290 Airline Boulevard in the General Mixed Use Zoning District. The future land use map of the Build One Portsmouth Comprehensive Plan designates this property as a mixed use corridor. The properties are owned by Batten 2 LLC, Raymond Batten, and is further described as tax map 582, parcel 2, 3, and 4, and tax map 583, parcel 4. The staff coordinator is Julie Chop, and the applicant has requested a deferral to the December the 5th Planning Commission meeting. At this time, we will open the public hearing. Um, for If there's anyone here who did not get an opportunity to register and would like to address this application, you may come forward, state your name and your address for the record, and you will be given up to five minutes to speak. Also, Madam Chair and Commissioners, Mr. Barclay is here if you have any questions of him. appearing to be no speakers, this item we will keep open. Um, the public hearing will stay open until our next meeting for uh, to be heard on the January the 5th Planning Commission meeting. I mean, December the 5th. <laughs> okay. So, okay. All right, we're good? Yeah, I think so. Okay. We still need a motion. Okay. We need a motion to defer until the December 5th Planning Commission meeting. Madam Chair. Sure. Commissioner Hines. I move that we defer uh, UP 23-20 into the December 5th meeting. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Jiggets. Madam Secretary, we have a first and a second. Thank you, Madam Chairman. We have a motion and a second to defer UP-23-20 to our December the 5th, 2023 meeting, and you will be voting electronically. This item is approved by a vote of 6-2-0. Our next item, UP-23-21, Hattonsville, Leaf, Burner request a use permit to operate a shipping container chassis storage yard on an approximately 5.4 acre parcel at 3015 Airline Boulevard in the Light Industrial Zoning District. The future land use map of the Build One Portsmouth Comprehensive Plan designates this property as a mixed use corridor. The property is owned by Burner Properties 3015 Airline LLC and is further described as tax map 574 parcel 3. The staff coordinator is Valerie Malzone. The applicant has requested a deferral of this application to the January the 2nd, 2024 Planning Commission public hearing. We will now open the public hearing for anyone who has not had an opportunity to register and would like to speak on this application. You have up to five minutes to speak. 
appearing to be none, Madam Chairman and members of the Planning Commission, this public hearing is now closed. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Commissioners, we are in need of a motion and a second to defer UP-23-21 Hatsonville to January the 2nd, 2024. Hi, um, I'd like to make a motion to defer UP 23-22 until January meeting. Second. Thank you. Madam Secretary, we have a motion and a second. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Motion and second to defer uh, until the January the 2nd, 2024 meeting and you will be voting electronically. This item is deferred by a vote of six to zero. Our next item, UP-23-22, Victory Crossing. Tanita Brinkley requests a use permit to operate an entertainment establishment on approximately 9.48 acre parcel located at 4010 Victory Boulevard, Suite B, in the general mixed use GMU zoning district. The future land use map of the Build One Portsmouth comprehensive plan designates this property for commercial use. The property is owned by Victory Crossing Marketplace LLC, Corey Lee, and is further described as tax map 526, parcel 2.2. The staff coordinator is Bill Landfair, Will the applicant or representative for this application please come forward and present your application at this time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> my name is Tanita Brinkley and I'm here with my partner, James Brinkley. And first of all, we wanna thank you so much for hearing us today and possibly allowing us to operate business in the city of Portsmouth. Luxury Affairs Event Center is a place for the community to come together to have events. My, by day, we are both accountants and we always do educational work, workshops. We have um, networking mixers and conferences for businesses to just come together to network, learn, and grow. There's also um, a need for us to come together as community leaders. So we have connected with other nonprofit organizations and um, people in home health care uh, industries to cater to the youth and the elderly. So we wanted to create luxury affairs event center to not only attract elite um, types of events in the city of Portsmouth, but to also have a home for our own events and workshops. Thank you, Ms. Brinkley. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, do you have any questions of the applicant? Yes, oh, I, I do. Um, would you also be entertaining wedding venues? Yes, so when we are not doing our own workshops, we will be renting the space out to others who want to have events and we will limit them to weddings, networking mixers and such like that. Thank you. When I saw the name, uh, it reminded me of Grand Affairs yes, in Virginia Beach. But what many of us here may not know, I happen to know because I worked in Baltimore for a number of years, that type of venue is very, very well known in the Baltimore Tri area. Um, and crab feasts, weddings, uh, fish fries, everything would take place within those type of venues. So I'm pleased to see that type of venue also coming to Portsmouth. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioners, are there any additional questions of the applicant? Commissioner Chair. I just Curry. want to commend you both for. <clears throat> for all the work you both have done in the community for years. Thank you. Um, give it back with all the workshops I've seen you do and 
poured into the women and the men of our community. It is definitely needed, and it's definitely needed back in our city of Portsmouth. Thank you. And I want to say thank you both for doing a great job. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioners, any further comment? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Brinkley, and your partner, of course. Thank you. Madam Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public hearing on item UP-23-22. I have no registered speakers. If there's anyone here who did not get an opportunity to register and would like to address this application, you may come forward, state your name and your address for the record, and you have up to five minutes to speak. You can you you can, you're welcome to sit down. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appearing to be no speakers, <clears throat> Madam Chairman, this public hearing is now closed. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Commissioners, if there's no further discussion, we are in need of a motion and a second on UP-23-22 Victory Crossing. Madam Chair, I also move to approve UP-23-22 with conditions. Madam Chair, I'll second that. Thank you. Madam Secretary, we have a first and a second with conditions. Didn't it have conditions? Thank you, mm -hmm. Thank you Madam Chairman. We have yes. a motion and a second to approve UP-23-22, and we will be voting electronically. This item is approved by a vote of 60-0 with conditions. Our next item, CA-23-03 Citywide. The City of Portsmouth proposes to amend City Code Chapter 40.2 Zoning Ordinance to remove privately operated correctional facilities from the definition of the correctional facility use. Prohibit privately operated correctional facilities within the city and such an additional modifications as may be deemed appropriate. The staff coordinator is Ms. Julie Chop, and she will be representing this application at this time. <clears throat> Good afternoon, planning commissioners. Uh, I am Julie Chop, manager of current planning and zoning with the Portsmouth Planning Department. This presentation will provide details on a proposed tax amendment to the city's zoning ordinance related to correctional facilities. The current definition of the correctional facility use in the zoning ordinance includes both public and privately operated facilities that house individuals awaiting trial or serving a sentence after being found guilty of a crime. A correctional facility requires a city council approved use permit to operate and can only be requested in the light industrial or industrial zoning districts. Two public uh, correctional facilities are currently located within the city of Portsmouth. Portsmouth City Jail is located at 701 Crawford Street and primarily houses those with short-term sentences as well as inmates that are awaiting transfer to another correctional facility. The Portsmouth City Jail was constructed in 1969 to accommodate 197 inmates and now houses approximately roughly 450. Due to the prime waterfront location of the Portsmouth City Jail, relocating the jail and the other municipal buildings along the waterfront to make way for private redevelopment has been a very long time goal of the city. The Hampton Roads Regional Jail was established in 1998 on the approximately 38 acre property at 2690 Elmhurst Lane to provide extra capacity and serve inmates that require special management from Chesapeake, Hampton, Newport News, Norfolk, and Portsmouth. This jail was constructed with the capacity to house 1,300 inmates and now houses roughly 200 inmates. On October 18th of this year, the Hampton Roads Regional Jail Authority did vote to close the facility by the spring of 2024. 
numerous studies have shown that the private for-profit correctional facility model encourages that business to cut corners, which can affect inmates' lives and their safety as well as their quality of life. In addition, um, a jail, jails are a large institutional use that have a significant impact on the local economy and community and do not provide significant community and employment benefits compared to similar uses of such a large scale. Staff did request that the Planning Commission initiate amendments to the zoning ordinance to uh, prohibit private correctional facilities in order to preemptively mitigate and minimize the potential negative impacts of this use on surrounding land uses. At the October 3rd Planning Commission public hearing, hearing a resolution was adopted um, initiating to staff to prepare these amendments. The proposed zoning ordinance amendment language is shown on this slide. The um, amendments prohibit privately operated correctional facilities um, from the city by removing privately operated correctional facilities from this definition of the correctional facility use, as well as revising the, the use, the term correctional <coughs> facility to public correctional facility um, throughout the ordinance to clarify this prohibition of privately operated correctional facilities. Public jails are an unfortunate necessity in our society. However, a private jail uh, is an inappropriate use for Portsmouth where much of the land is already developed um, as it would put an additional strain on city resources and bring little economic benefit. Staff recommends approval of these proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance in order to mitigate and minimize impacts on the surrounding land uses and protect the interests of the citizens and businesses while maintaining the health, safety, and welfare of the public. This concludes my presentation and I'll stand by for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Chop. Commissioners, are there any questions? Commissioner Jiggets? Yes, and this just came to mind. What about for, unfortunately, in this society, we sometimes have little children who, because of whatever's going on, uh, they need to be jailed. Um, is, it, is it possible that this is the only way with a private jail that children under a certain age could actually be held and that the public, our public uh, correctional facilities would not accommodate a child. That's, that's, the, that's the point I want to try to get to. Um, well, so I believe that we, so we, we did add a line at the, at the end of the definition that, um, that kind of clarifies that this, this public correctional facility use does not include halfway houses mm -hmm. um, or kind of similar uses to that. So I would, as, I would assume that there would, there would be a, um, that I don't, I don't know if, did, if they would just go into a halfway house or I, I can let um, city attorney. And I understand because it's a question that just came to my mind because I think We've had a situation like that recently, I think, in one of the other cities. I don't know how they ended up uh, being held, but I would like to know if we do know the answer on that. Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Jiggets. Uh, You're welcome. There are, there are public uh, uh, juvenile correctional mm -hmm. facilities as well. I believe you're thinking possibly of the Chesapeake uh, facility which is public and um, Portsmouth originally had sent juveniles to Pes to Chesapeake um, however uh, is not able to do so anymore and so it's been placing juveniles with other public facilities but I think like Ms. Chop said uh, we were dealing here only with institutional correctional facilities large institutional correctional facilities so in the event that halfway houses are like uh, or something similar were being used, 
this amendment would not affect that. But in general, juvenile offenders are also sent to public facilities in the region. But not in city of Portsmouth. We don't have accommodations we don't, at this time. We don't currently have an institutional facility like that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hines. Thank you. And, and this is actually more of a kind of a cleanup, if I'm not misunderstanding it, because right now we only have this, the two public jails anyway. We haven't in historically operated private jails or institutions of that nature anyway. Am I, am I correct in saying so? Yes. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, Thank you. any additional questions? No? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Chop. Thank you. Madam Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public hearing on item CA-23-03. I have no registered speakers. If there's someone here who did not get an opportunity to register and would like to address this application, you may come forward, state your name and your address for the record, and you will have up to five minutes to speak. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, if there's no additional questions, we are in need of a motion and a second. I gotta close the oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I jumped the gun. Uh, <laughs> appearing to be no speakers. Madam Chairman, <laughs> members of the Planning Commission, this public hearing is now closed. Thank you, Madam you're, Secretary. You're welcome, Chairman. <laughs> if there's uh, no further questions, then we are commissioners in need of a motion and a second to approve CA-23-02 citywide. Madam Chair, yes. uh, I move that we approve CA-23-03 as presented. I second. Thank you. Madam Secretary, we have a motion and a second. Thank you, Madam Chairman. We have a motion and a second to approve CA-23-03, and you will be voting electronically. This item is approved by a vote of 6 to 0. Commissioners, uh, we have new business. Uh, we will need a motion and a second to just move forward with uh, the following. The first one is a resolution to update and amend the Build One Portsmouth Comprehensive Plan. We are in need of a motion and a second. I'd like to make a motion to um, allow for the staff for the resolution of the comprehensive plan. Second. Thank you. Madam Secretary, we have a motion and a second. Thank you, Madam Chairman. M motion and second to update a resolution to amend the Build yes. One Portsmouth comprehensive plan and we will be voting electronically. This item is approved by a vote of six to zero. Commissioners, the second under new business is a resolution to update and amend city code 33.1 subdivision ordinance. We will need a motion and a second to move forward. Madam Chair. Uh, move that we approve the resolution to initiate amendments to the subdivision ordinance as prepared to be prepared by staff. A second. Thank you. Madam Secretary, we have a motion and a second. Motion and second to approve a resolution to update and amend city code chapter 33.1 subdivision ordinance and we will be voting electronically. Commissioner Jiggins. This item is approved by vote of six to zero. Commissioners, the third resolution to update and amend the innovation overlay district standards of the city code 40.2 of the zoning ordinance. We are in need of a motion 
and a sequit second, excuse me, to move forward. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so move. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Huh. I can remember. I make a motion to um, allow for the amendment to the zoning ordinance uh, for the innovation district. Second. Second. <laughs> I want to do it. I We're just can't remember eager. everything you said. But I, I so move. <laughs> We're eager for that trade. Um, okay. Thank you. Madam Secretary. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'm going to ask a quick question. Commissioner, please. yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, there was additional items here, these 15 pages. I believe they were said they were uh, just an attachment to maybe talk about the vision things about nature we are not voting on those correct that is correct all we're sure doing clear. correct that Thank is you. all we're doing is giving them an opportunity to uh, come back and provide us with a report thank you you're welcome do we have a first and a second mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. um, we have a motion then to second to um, approve a resolution to update and amend the innovation district the overlay district standards of the co uh, city code 40.2 in the zoning ordinance. You will be voting electronically. This item is approved 6 to 0. Thank you. Yes, Commissioners, we are in need of a motion and a second with the fourth item, which is a resolution to update dimensional allowances for residentially zoned lots and city code chapter 40.2 of the zoning ordinance. Commissioner Hines. Uh, before I make a motion, I actually do have a question on this particular item here. I know we just had some discussion and cleanup with the Board of Zoning Appeals regarding some non-conforming items that, you know, uh, is this going to kind of make a quick pit stop by them as well in, in this to make sure we're not creating another potential problem for them? We would definitely share the information with the, the BZA once we come up with the uh, policy and recommendation. Thank you. Uh, with, with that, if I may, I, I'll go ahead and make a uh, motion to approve the resolution to initiate the amendments to the zoning ordinance regarding legal non-conforming lots. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to second that motion. Madam Secretary, we have a motion and a second. Motion and second to approve resolution to update dimensional allowances for residentially zoned lots in the city code of the 40.2 zoning ordinance, and you will be voting electronically. This item is approved by a vote of five to one. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Commissioners, uh, the fifth item we need a motion and a second to move forward with the Certified Planning Commissioner Program Training. No? No. What are we that, doing with this that, then? That is just for inform informational purposes. Okay. The email that you guys received yes, relative to it, if you could let me know today before you, before you leave so that I can go ahead and get you registered. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I believe the final item is that we are in need of a motion and a second to move forward with the draft 2024 Planning Commission meeting calendar. Mm -hmm. No? And you don't need to vote on it. Don't need to do that either. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's all right. We don't need yeah. to do that either. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Secretary. That's just a draft. Just, it's just a draft. Madam Secretary, I believe that concludes our agenda for today. Is that correct? That is correct. Commissioners, will there be any further business? No. Ms. Adamwa, any further business? No further business. Okay. I'd like to wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving and this meeting right. is adjourned. All right.